Fantastic. And how, how does it feel to be back in Taiwan now? It's awesome. I mean, I, I used to come here a lot as a kid. And then uh, because of Twitch, actually, I came out here quite a bit. Taiwan was one of our top countries uh, very early on, top five countries since the beginning. Um, uh, Taipei was our number one city by minutes watched per user. For real? Yeah, for a long time, for several years, uh, in in like let's say the 2011 to 2014 or so era, um, and so I came out here quite a bit, but never lived here. Um, but living here is is pretty amazing. It's safe, people are friendly, it's uh, very affordable, lots of fun things to do. Um, it's it's pretty awesome. I can totally agree. I feel like most of us Hua Chiao, people with Taiwanese parents, all kind of come here and just immediately feel at home. Yeah, there is something. About, yeah, it's the people, right? I mean, I think for me, you know, from a climate and and stuff to do perspective, it is similar to New Orleans. You know, it's warm, it's humid, it's rainy, um, um, and and some people don't like that. But for me, it's perfectly normal. Summer's here, a lot of people escape, and I'm like, eh, it's it's fine. Um, but the people are so nice and and friendly, and they follow up, and um, and it's easy to build a community here. Uh, so it's easy to stick. And I'm curious, what's New Orleans like? Because I'm a jazz fan, so I know about New Orleans like back a hundred years ago. But what was it like now? Yeah, I mean, it. You know, it's interesting. It it's sort of a stuck in time kind of place. Um, after Katrina, a lot of people left, of course, and slowly people started trickling back. But you know, those those stalwarts, those those community, you know, nodes, so to speak, stayed, and and a lot of the same fixtures are there. A lot of the same music places, same restaurants stuck stuck around and made it through everything. Right, Katrina, COVID, and now Ida, another hurricane, and it just seems like as much as that city gets, you know, beaten down by natural disaster. Um, people still love it and, and stay. And, and everything they s have always said about New Orleans, I think, remains true. People are friendly. It is, it is full of music. You know, music essentially falls from the sky. Everywhere you go, you can hear music. Um, food is amazing, although you do have to you have to watch yourself. Um, and there's lots of great architecture and fun things to do. Mardi Gras is amazing. If you've never been to Mardi Gras, I highly recommend. It's not really what you expect from the marketing you see. It, it can be crazy shenanigans, but it's actually quite family friendly. I, used to, I started going when I was a baby, a baby, basically, two or three years old. As soon as I could like, figure out what beads were, I loved it every year, not to mention school was off. Um, so it's, it's a great place. Uh, you know, it's got its, it's got its rough edges. Right. It's got it's got it's got crime. It's got some issues there um, historically. Um, and it, it's not so it's not so you know it's hard to solve those types of problems um but they're trying and and i think generally you know generally a fun place to go far out well i certainly have to go and it seems like a nice balance between you know having a life between new orleans and taipei they've got their own contrasts but some similarities there as well yeah very much so i mean it depends you know it's like it's like both of these places that have something for everybody um depending on what you like to do and, and how you like to hang out and if you're a night owl or not a morning person um lots of fun things so it's all about like finding finding your balance there absolutely well speaking of finding your balance make sure you stay tuned we're going to be heading into a song right now but we'll have more of kevin and his story here on icrt so stay tuned to fm 100 don't you go anywhere you're listening to icrt fm 100 it's 209 p.m this is sweet talk and we just heard taylor swift's love story which i think is the perfect song to describe this past weekend because it was Wu erling 520 may 20th which i just learned over the weekend weekend is actually some sort of Taiwanese Valentine's Day. Did you know that, no, Kevin? No, I didn't. Now I feel like I'm in trouble. Uh, you're going to be fine. Uh, <laughs> I only found out because on Saturday nights, I sing at a place called Smexy. And uh, the singer before me that, that sings between eight and nine o'clock, her entire set were songs that were all, I love you, I love you, I love you. And she got on the mic and she gave the mic to all these different you know, customers at Smexy to say, I love you to their partner or whoever they were with at the time. And I was like, damn, my entire set is breakup songs. What am I doing? So I had to quickly change my entire set and I started off with Love Story. Wow. Yeah. And Speaking of managing things on the fly, that's quite a change for an entire set. To you gotta have to. I mean, yeah. you have to. It's it's literally like a, some sort of Taiwanese Valentine's Day. I can't come on in with saying, What's singing Adele, you know? Yeah. What's the history of Wu Erling? What is... I'm not really sure uh, what the history is, but I've heard that Wu Erling is kind of like Wu Aini. Uh, Do you hear it? I don't I know. I guess. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I barely speak Mandarin though, so. That's all right. Yeah. L- luckily, this is English radio. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, if you're just joining us, today's guest is Kevin Lin. Now, he is formerly the co-founder and COO of Twitch. And by the way, we are also streaming on Twitch. So head on over to twitch.tv forward slash ICRT to join in on the fun and send the Kevin emote or the Caitlin emote if you want while we are doing this interview. But Kevin is also the co-founder and CEO of Meta Theory, which is an interactive technology an entertainment company. Now, tell us a bit more about Meta Theory. This is your most recent company. What is it about? What is your goal? Tell me. Yeah, yeah. So at the core, um, at the core, to put simply, we're an IP building company. Our tools are things like games, uh, animation, comics, uh, and social media. Um, and so we launched a we launched as a Web three game company. That's sort of the you know quick summary. Um, bullet of what we are um, at the core too, in terms of we're trying to leverage new technology. Now we're also using AI as everybody is, um, but it's really about how do we build a bridge to blockchain and this sort of new concepts of your relationship with the internet um, and digital products that blockchain um, can bring to consumers. And and so that's the general idea of, can you make games where similar to real world collectibles like Magic the Gathering cards or Pokemon cards that you can keep and have ownership of and, and theoretically participate as value increases if that audience grows um, um, and you know card value increases. Similarly, can you make digital items the same? And so that was just something fascinating that we, my co-founders and I and, and our, our founding team kind of latched onto as a concept. Um, and then there's this idea of transferability and interoperability, as in you can take those objects and use them in other worlds. I think that's a really long time coming. I don't, the, the, this whole metaverse thing is like whatever, but it's it's a, it's far in the future. Um, but that was sort of the, the, the initial idea. And um, we are building... Um, you know, IP that's cross-generational and, and truly global to bring you know, diverse storytelling uh, and characters to to what we're trying to build in terms of world building. Um, and, you know, so we're building games. Um, we've made some animation, animated content. We're testing like VTuber technology and, and many other things. We've written some web comics. We've created a visual novel system, all sort of foundational work so that now we can really accelerate and start cr- um, telling these stories, but um, most importantly, drive people into these interactive experiences. Um, namely games. Uh, so we have one IP out there called Dustbreakers. We launched it as an NFT project in December 2021. Um, and then we launched a second uh, sort of uh, companion uh, NFT collection called the Gribbles, which are these like alien bugs. The whole story is is, is the future and the spaceship has come to Earth when Earth is sort of down and out um, and has sort of Earth-saving materials, life-saving materials that the humans start to mine and bring down to Earth um, to improve the human condition and and improve our relationship with the planet Um, but it's a mysterious ship it's sort of dormant nothing's really going on but on the surface there are these little bugs and other creatures that we're starting to encounter Uh, and so that's sort of the present time of our games as we're visiting this this ship and there's bugs there we don't know if they're enemies or friendly we don't really know why they're there even are they are they do they own the ship do they not own the ship we're not sure are they stowaways um and so that's sort of the the present time of our storytelling um but yeah that's the that's what we're working on um when it comes to meta theory um we have a team here in taiwan um one of my um you know ambitions is 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 to work with um, teams here and 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 eventually more broadly into southeast asia um i think there's a lot of talent here um and have learned directly that that's true and so we have a team of 18 people in Taipei building games, animations, art, um, visual effects, like really, really ramping up towards you know, building deeper and deeper games with this added complexity of blockchain. Fantastic. Well, I'm curious because you're the entrepreneur and founder of so many influential organizations like Meta Theory and Twitch. What's kind of the typical week for someone like you? It seems like a lot of work to build and design a game and test it. Yeah, I learned that game. So I'm a software. I'm a software guy technically, and and softwares and ga- software building and game building are very different processes. Gaming, um, it, games are just a bit more. They're longer processes, and there's a lot of things to consider. There's art. There's lore. There's game design. Um, 
Uh, and so there's just a bit more that goes in. And then you have to do a decent amount before you get to true user testing. You can get user research done, user feedback done. But until you get that product done, which is the melding of all these things, um, it's hard to get true user feedback on what you're building versus software, where you can kind of build something a lot more quickly. It's, I'm oversimplifying, but you can get stuff out there faster and start to get user actual hands-on user user testing. Um, so I'm learning that. Um, and and we, have, we have a lot of great team members now that have been more experienced in the games industry that are helping with those types of processes and getting building up speed. Um, and so that, that's been uh, fun to learn. But the average day is pretty, because we are global. We're a remote company. Um, I also have other, a few other projects that I work on. So I'm up typically, I try to wake up at 6. My first call is at 6.30 in the morning. And then um, uh, pretty much all day until my last call. I'm trying to have my last call end at 11 o'clock at night. Um, and But then some days it's literally jammed from 6.30 till 11 with maybe an hour or two break here or there. Oh, my goodness. It's so not you, tenable. 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. just to, just yes, to justify. Okay, yeah, wow. It, it happens. It happens. I don't recommend it. Um, I'm trying to change that. Um, and But it's tough when you, you, know, you have a remote team and you want to you know, make sure... Um, ideas are heard and people are people feel people feel like, like you know they can they can offer feedback and ideas um, and so but we we are sort of readjusting things and I'm gonna try to stop taking calls at night and go to bed early you know I try to go to bed like ten and then wake up like five maybe or eleven to five would be good for me yeah. We were literally just talking about this as Taylor Swift's song was playing about how we need to get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah, sleep and sun. Sun in the morning is really important, as it turns out. Oh, um, shouldn't we just live by the beachside? Then we'll always get sun. Ideal. Yeah, what, what are cities yeah. for? We should just spread out. You could do a call by the ocean. I'm sure yeah. that'll work. Oh, too. Yeah, some ambiance. Yeah. You know, they've got sound isolation these days. No one knows where you are. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be heading into another song, but make sure you stay tuned to hear more from Kevin. As you can see, we're just scratching the surface of his incredible busy schedule and also all the ideas that he has. This one is Ariana Grande with The Weeknd, Save Your Tears remix playing right now on FM 100. Don't you go anywhere. We're here to sweeten up your afternoon. You're listening to ICRT FM 100. That was Miguel with Sure Thing. And we're just having an exciting day here at the ICRT studio because it's a Tuesday. And every Tuesday, I have a special guest. Now, today's guest is Kevin Lin, who is the CEO and founder of Meta Theory. And he's also the co founder and former COO of Twitch. And by the way, if you have a Twitch account or even if you don't, open up a web browser if it's safe. So if you're driving, don't do this <laughs> and search www.twitch.tv forward slash ICRT and come and say hi and if you've got any questions for Kevin that's where you got to go but we were just having such an interesting conversation of chat GTP and you're all for it isn't that right Kevin yeah I mean it's it's here uh, so for the listeners that don't know what chat GPT is it it is an AI um, that uh, is designed as a chat bot that you talk to and it does things and it has indexed so much information from before um, September 2021. It actually just got a re recent update where it can actually look at current information on the internet, um, very similar to Google Google Bard. Um, and we were just talking about you know how how folks are using it. Um, highly recommend everyone listening out there to to try it out. Um, it, there, it's free. Uh, there is a premium version, um, which allows you to use um, sort of faster, you get faster service, you get more reliable uptime, um, but it's, it's basically free and it works generally for anybody. Um, ChatGPT4 is the newer version that came out um, several months ago. There's also 3.5 that is, that I think 3.5 is like 100% free. Through four is there's versions that you can pay for. I forget exactly how it works, but effectively free. It can, it can help you do anything. Um, and it's a technology worth using a lot of people are scared that it's going to replace jobs um, and that's why they're angry at AI um, but I, I think yes that is probably true there are certain jobs that you may no longer need um, but as our community global community uh, species matures we'll learn to integrate it and, and new jobs will come as a result and utilizing AI technology will be critical to those jobs. It's just going to be a new interface, right? So rather than opening a mail client, you'll open a mail client that has AI and it'll help you write your emails. That's it. It's it's not. It shouldn't be that threatening. Um, but again, yes, there are certain things that will will likely be removed um, uh, from need um, from societal need. Uh, but that's okay because new things will come. Have you been using ChatGTP on your day to day with your tasks and work? 
Yeah, I use it from everything. I try to use it all the time. Um, I use it uh, almost like I use Google now. Right, I'll search for what's a, what's a good restaurant um, in Taipei for tonight. Um, uh, I will. The more interesting things I think I use it for is I use it for I use it for workout planning. We were just talking about that. Um, uh, so I'll, I've typed in sort of my goals and and um, uh, calorie goals, fitness goals, and then I'll have it at, spit out every week for me a recommended workout based on what I did before. So I'm constantly updating it on that particular thread. Um, I use it for writing. And so um, part of meta theory, we're trying to create all this lore. Our team uses it this way too. They've written now all this lore inside of ChatGPT and really use it almost as a writing companion um, as you might uh, a normal person. Um, but it remembers so much more and it can it can really work with you long term on designing an entire universe. Um, and then from the universe, pluck out narrative, character, arcs, relationships, um, it can also pull in sort of current themes um, if you ask it to. Really, you can ask it to do anything. You can write in many different styles. And so we use that as inspiration and then go to the, you know, go to the drawing board and write ourselves. But we use it as this, like, instead of writing in, like, a giant Google Doc, you can just write in ChatGPT and it'll remember all this stuff and help you understand the universe, even maybe remind you of certain things. I've And so we use it that way as well. Um, and then we use it for basic, you know, simple things, making emails sound better, making social media posts sound better. Um, and you can you can even design entire social media marketing campaigns with it. Right? Far you, can, out. you can write code. Uh, our, our tech team will use it to write code now. And so we'll say, as a simple example, um, we want a weapon in our game to operate like a sonic boom from Guile in Street Fighter, and it will spit out that code. We have to massage it a little bit and change it up, but um, it is it is pretty good. Um, it's a really remarkable tool and so a translation been, as well. You've been encouraging all your staff to use AI and also to use Chat DTP. Oh yeah, we pay for it. Um, oh. If you, you if you subscribe to it, we pay for it. Um, we're we're building a lot of our own. Um, uh, our own stack for other AI tools. So stability is another one that's on the art side. Uh, it's art generation, um, stability, stable diffusion, mid journey. Uh, there's a lot of products now that are out there that are making the creative process go faster. And again, similar to what I said before, it's not that artists are being replaced by us. We still want the concept artist to use these tools as inspiration. It's faster inspiration and iter iteration process on concept art. And now, a person like me who can't draw, I don't do art. I can make art in mid journey or stability, hand it over to my team and say, it's something like this, right? Used to, you kind of did the same thing. In, in my opinion, I know a lot of artists are upset, upset by AI and there's a lot of regulatory issues that will come and need to be solved to protect artists. I totally agree with that. Um, but the reason I like it is because I can then, instead of just going to Google and searching, okay, you know, I want Studio Ghibli film, Spirited Away, The Creature from the Forest, send me some examples. I'm doing the same thing anyway. But now I can just tell the AI, to, okay, it's inspired by these different character designs, these different art styles, and it'll spit out a bunch of different iterations. Then I can go speak more clearly with my artists and say, hey, like, here's the inspiration. Here's what I've been thinking. What do you think? And then they'll take it and draw it. Right. Um, um, eventually, there's that that process will go even faster from 2D concept all the way to 3D model rigged, ready for game, ready for animated show. And so that part of the process, which has historically taken forever, if you look at um, you know Pixar, DreamWorks films, when you render a scene, it can take all night, a singular scene. And so that's why those movies are so expensive and take so long to make. That process, because of AI, is going to go so much faster now. And so you're going to see this massive influx, this glut of content creation at a scale that we haven't seen before. Like YouTube, right, already increased YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, etc. Those that those online video platforms have already increased so much content because it democratized the creation. Right. Anybody can put something anywhere for anyone to see in the world. Now this, you know, next level of more complex creation of video games or animated shows or other things, almost anyone's gonna be able to do that even if you've never been trained to make art. You can just do it with new tools. So there's going to be a massive increase in, in content on that side of things. So I encourage people to try it out. Um, and it's fun. You know, I can make a little art thing and send it to somebody, and it's fun. It's cute. It's funny. It's, like, on point. It's in context, um, and it can be hilarious. So meme creation also will go up. Um, but I highly encourage people to test it out. 
Fantastic. Well, we're going to be taking a little break. Enjoy this next one by Sia Chandelier. But stay tuned because we're going to chat more with Kevin about, well, what his day to day is like and what his companies have been up to. As you can see, we're having a fantastic conversation and I'm getting so inspired as we speak. Enjoy this one and we'll be right back. The ICRT FM 100. I'm DJ Caitlin with Sweet Talk, and joining me to make this afternoon even more sweeter is Kevin Lynn. Welcome back to ICRT. Hello, thank you. It's been such an inspiring day today. I'm learning so many things, especially about AI, about meta theory, about Twitch, just so many things. I think if we didn't cross paths today, I probably would have taken years to find out about. Oh, yeah. It's 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 lo- the the speed of technology has always been fast. Um, it is getting even faster um, exponentially with AI. Um, and so it's it's uh, it's incredible. And I, I think what's interesting about the AI stuff now is it, it's starting to hit consumers. There's been AI behind the scenes that people have been using for a while, for a really, really long time. Um, but now it's sort of becoming more productized uh, on a consumer level. And so more people are starting to understand it and realize. And there's fear, of course, that comes with that. Like, oh my God, like, wait, how long has this been tech been around? And what you see, ChatGPT is the example we were talking about earlier, a small fraction of what AI can do. How are you keeping up with all these technology changes? Um, luckily, I have a lot of friends that help me keep up with it. And I, 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 you know, I just try to use a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then uh, obviously encouraging the team helps because then they're looking for interesting new things. But I'd say I'm lucky because having spent yeah, having spent so much time in San Francisco, right, uh, 14 plus years, um, you meet a lot of cool people. And, and San Francisco is having a bit of a quote unquote renaissance. I mean, a lot of people always, you know, oh, San Francisco is down. It's it's dirty. It's crime ridden, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of always been like that and and um, in, in a way, but never that bad. But the coolest thing about San Francisco to me is... Um, the community there of builders and people who are obsessed with innovation uh, and challenging each other and thinking together. I think of it as it, it is the human deep mind of innovation in San Francisco, where they have the perfect mix of everything, right? Funding, investors, mentorship, people have done it before, um, and, and incredible talent that keeps coming. And they're just constantly thinking and pushing each other, like, what else can we do with technology? Um, and so I still benefit, despite not being there anymore, benefit from my friends over there sort of sending me stuff all the time of like, check this out, check that out, um, uh, from every aspect, from people building to people investing and being just general people curious about what's going on. Um, but to keep up with AI, I mean, there's a handful of folks out there on Twitter. I would just follow, you know, six, seven people that update almost every day. There's hundreds of products coming out every single day um, because AI has now made creation. Again, early to the point earlier, oh, I don't know if we we're on, on air then, um, but creation of assets, creation of content is is what I think a lot of consumers are going to experience from the, the result of AI. Um, but underlying all this stuff, all the technology that allows for the consumer experience is just accelerating so fast. Um, and it's like, you know, AI building AI. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, that's happening, and so that starts to get even faster and faster, right? AI at the core is a lot about efficiency. You know, it's, it's, it's you know one of the things it's essentially told to do is make this as efficient as possible, regardless of what the output's supposed to be. And so that's just making us faster, um, and in itself is getting faster. Well, we've spoken a lot about AI and also about San Francisco, but I want to know more about your story and how you started in entrepreneurship. And I know San Francisco plays a big part of that. So tell us, how did you get into entrepreneurship and this world of technology? Yeah, so a bit of an accident. I mean, I, I, I graduated from college in 2004. I studied ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I had planned, pseudo planned to become a veterinarian. That's what I told my parents. I was like, okay, it's close enough to being a doctor. And they were like, okay, this seems like fine. It seems like it's a respectable job. It's a tough job. And I did um, some volunteer work in, in New Orleans on the West Bank at a place called Acres. Um, you have to get 2,400 hours or 2,500 hours, I forget, in order to apply for veterinary school. And I did like 1,800 hours there one summer working essentially at a zoo, a sort of a research facility a non-public zoo where we had to like feed the animals, take care of them. Anyway, after that whole process, I kind of realized working with the veterinarian there, like, I don't really want to do this. But I went through with it anyway. And I told my parents I was going to New York City um, uh, after school to 
work to volunteer. Yeah, it's all volunteer work for the largest animal medical center in in America, the, the animal medical center in New York. Only I got there, I applied, and I was like 150th in line. And they were like, you might be able to volunteer in like two years. And I was like, oh, crap, like that's not going to work. Um, and so I started looking for work in New York and then eventually worked for my brother, uh, introduced me to his friend Marat Armbruster, who was who had just joined a company called Adina for Life, which was a San Francisco beverage company started by the late uh, Adwa- uh, Adwala founder Greg Steltonpole, who went on to found Califia Farms, which is now a huge, huge beverage company in in America and I think spreading around the world. So anyway, I was uh, uh, working for Marat in Boston. He, my brother, lived in Boston. I was like, oh, perfect! I can spend time with my brother, and I could, you know, learn this work experience of selling beverages. And eventually, Marat was like, hey, why don't you come to San Francisco? The headquarters of Adina was in San Francisco, and so I went out to San Francisco, uh, December two thousand five, and worked for them for a couple of weeks. And they eventually asked me to move out there. Uh, so I talked to my then girlfriend in New York, uh, and we decided to move. And so I moved in January two thousand six. Um, got there and was they had just bought this beverage distribution company. I started working in the warehouse, selling beverages, slinging sugar water. Basically, we had like 700 different SKUs. I know a lot about sodas and juices and teas now. Um, and then um, Michael Seibel, um, one of my closest friends in college, um, and Justin Kahn, also a good buddy from college, um, drove across the country in 2006 to move to San Francisco from Boston after selling their first startup, Emmett, Emmett, um, Emmett Shear, CEO, recent CEO or C- longtime CEO of, of Twitch recently left, my co-founder. Uh, they all drove across the country from Boston to San Francisco just to be in the thick of it, to be in San Francisco where all the magic was happening. And uh, eventually they recruited me in. Um, in 2008, um, I was sort of not super excited about my job anymore. My parents were constantly bugging me about why didn't I go to graduate school and, you know, why was I wasting my college education working in a warehouse, um, even though I, I actually really enjoyed it. Um, but they were right. They, they were right. I should try to do more. And so I, Michael one day called me and said, hey, we need some help. We need some help putting together some projections and estimates for like where this company can go. Will you come meet me in the morning and help? And so I did for about two weeks. And then finally, you know, I was like, okay, cool, all's done, good luck. They were trying to raise some money. Um, and uh, one day, Michael and Justin invited me to lunch at Louisiana Fried Chicken on 3rd and King, right across from the ballpark. We ordered our food, and before I could even take a bite, Justin just looked me dead in the eye and was like, you should join us. And I was like, okay, I'll tell you the same thing I told Michael right when he asked me to help. I was like, I don't know anything about the internet. I know nothing. I know I don't know how it works. I, I don't even know how to monetize. Like, I don't know jack and they're like we don't care like we really just want to work with people we trust that we feel like we can we can grow with and challenge each other and so i talked to some friends and i was like i was mostly nervous because i was like i don't know any i don't know anything how could i possibly do this job and a couple of my friends were like well you didn't know anything about beverages before and i'm like well yeah but i work in a warehouse like it's not that hard um um but you know there was a lot to figure out from an operations perspective um and then you know the guts to call and sell like you had to i had to cold call grocery stores and restaurants and visit them and bring samples and it was a lot of on the ground work and good good great work experience actually um so i decided to join um and that's how i got into the startup world i became a founder of twitch in 2000 a co-founder of twitch in 2010 2011 when we uh, uh decided to kind of deviate we we had justin tv that was the original product that uh, michael and justin brought me onto with emmett and kyle those are the four co-founders um i was there to help do the business, right? Figure out um, everything from accounting and financial projections to recruiting and HR to like, what do we do with this? Who do we sell it to? So I started meeting with, you know, sports companies and news companies and eventually game companies in 2010. Uh, and then 2010 was with that spark when StarCraft II came out. Um, we were like, wait a second, our company is going to die because we're playing too much StarCraft II. But the <laughs> aha moment was we were watching StarCraft II on YouTube all the time. And we noticed that um, we had a, we always had a small gaming community on on Justin TV back then. There were streamers like Kaiba and Four Player Podcast and several others. Um, and uh, eventually leaned into that. And then I became a co-founder in 2011 as we sort of split the company in two two different projects. Michael took one with two engineers called Social Cam that sold to Autodesk pretty quickly. Um, and then StarCraft II had come out, and we were starting to realize that. Um, we were playing too much and we would be the death of our own company if we didn't focus. Um, we were lucky, we made it through the recession, profitable, um, and it allowed us to start tinkering. And um, in May 2010, 
we got access to the StarCraft II beta, miraculously. We didn't know anyone in the games industry yet. Um, but we played, we'd, I guess maybe because we played a lot of StarCraft before. And um, started thinking, you know, we started noticing that we were, ourselves, our own behavior was we would go home and watch StarCraft II videos, go back to the office late dreary-eyed, late, late dreary-eyed because we were like staying up late watching YouTube or playing StarCraft. And then we, you know, by lunchtime, we start playing StarCraft. We're like, let's just play StarCraft today. Yeah, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to do anything. Let's just play StarCraft. And we're playing StarCraft all the time. And uh, um, finally, this sort of mini light bulb moment where we're like, okay, maybe we can turn this into a live thing. And and um, we did have this small but vibrant um, gaming community. We noticed that some of the top YouTubers that were creating StarCraft content were streaming on other platforms like Ustream and Livestream. And we finally did the right thing for ourselves and the company and the product and our community, which was we started talking to our customers. It's not that we didn't do that before. Justin and Michael and Emmett and Kyle had talked to a lot of different types of streamers on Justin TV, but we didn't really spend a lot of time with the, with the customer. We also had two customers in mind. One was viewers and one was creators. We didn't really call them creators back then. We just sort of called them streamers. Um, we still call them streamers today, but creators as the broad category um, was still a very nascent concept. Like this whole idea of the creator economy was still really not formed yet back then in 2008, 2009. Um, and uh, we started in mass and very deliberately talking to StarCraft streamers, StarCraft content creators, both YouTubers and streamers, to understand what their desires were. Like, what do you hope this, what, what, what happens here? Um, if Twitch works for you, if, if this product originally Justin TV Gaming, where could it go? What does it mean to you? And we got lots of great ideas like, well, you know, I want to be, I want it to be my career. I just want to do this full time. I, I want to make money. And we got ideas on how they can make money based off of that. So little things that people maybe take for granted these days. One, commercial breaks. At the time, the state of the art was we just ran commercials whenever, randomly, every 20 minutes. Ustream was the same way, Livestream was the same way. It was the only way to monetize effectively at the time. YouTube really set that tone in the industry. You got video online, you're going to sell ads against it. And uh, our creators like, I hate it because all of a sudden an ad runs and my, my users, my, my viewers complain because it ran an ad over the most important part of the battle. And so like, oh, what if we handed it to you and made it your choice? Our board at the time, write the correct feedback. Our investors were like, yo, no one's going to run ads. And we're like, we just got to trust the creators here. They're telling us they will do it because earning revenue is important. Um, so we had to take a little bit of a risk there of, of giving the power to them. And it worked. Um, and then the subscription idea. Really, the, the first at scale built into platform subscription system we built based on creator feedback. Um, Day9 um, was one of the most influential there. He was an early StarCraft streamer, uh, very vocal, incredibly smart. Now he's building video games. But just a really thoughtful creator um, started to say, to tell us these ideas of, well, it was based on simple things. Like back then, donations were a big thing, but people would donate through GoFundMe, these widgets, chip in paypal but they were inconsistent and oftentimes their money would disappear they would get locked up they wouldn't send in the cash and so but part of that was they didn't like it because they felt bad they felt like they were just taking money with no way of thinking in a meaningful way and so we turned that product feedback into a subscription okay well now you get a badge in chat you get recognition. We'll eventually build more tools that allow you to interface with the subscribers more. And the creators would do their own thing, right? They would do subscriber-only games, subscriber-only chat. We built all these various tools, but a lot of it was them, how they decided without our own features, again, at the time, but we added more features over time, how they would interface with the paying patrons effectively. And that was all through actually talking with creators, finally, identifying creators as our core customer, not ignoring viewers, but channeling through the creators what viewers want right they are a conduit they are themselves viewers and so we started to become less distracted right it's hard when you're like okay well there's tens of millions of people who want this stuff oh but what do the creators really need viewers want infinite features creators are like well what about this first and this next and so it helped us really focus in and that was that was really a game changer for us internally that final true identification of the customer um, so anyway, so that was that. And then, you know, we, we um, started to grow. I mean, it grew so fast, um, really almost out of control. Our costs would spike because, you know, live video is all about um, 
delivery over over the internet pipes and the more utilization of those inter- internet pipes you have at any given moment the more expensive your product becomes and so our product was super expensive because we go through these massive spikes and it was this article i think this is when my mom started to figure out my, my parents started to figure out what we were doing there's an article in the wall street journal that listed out in the u.s this was 2014 i believe in the u.s um the top 10 um concurrent bits pushers of traffic and as you might guess, at the top were Netflix, uh, uh, Apple, um, uh, Amazon. And we were there number four. And no one knew who we were. People were like, what is Twitch? Right? You recognize all this other stuff, Hulu, HBO, et cetera, et cetera, um, ESPN, I think. Um, but we were square there, number four. People were like, what is this product? Why are people using it? What is this all about? And uh, there was this general disbelief, too, amongst the 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 industry that people would watch other people play video games we had talked to again news people sports people historically trying to do deals with them and there's this disbelief like why would people this is so stupid there's no one does this right turns out an entire generation grew up doing it you know if you're at your friend's house you're at the arcade you're not playing what are you doing you're watching you're watching It's, it's almost like an accidental entertainment format right not designed for it necessarily although i know some of the early game designers were like well you know probably cool to watch too right but it wasn't designed for watching it's designed for fun on on hand interactive gameplay Um, but a lot of it ended up being fun to watch most of it really um and so we kind of stumbled into it frankly we stumbled into it um and and got lucky uh in in the sense we had a good timing window everything converged well right um so that was it uh and then yeah i left uh i stayed there we sold amazon 2014 stayed there for six and a half years um learned a lot you know uh, learned a lot about uh, culture at scale, um, how to be efficient and operational efficiency at the scale of an organization that's that big. I mean, we grew to like 25, uh, 2,400 or so by the time I left, and it's ebbed and flowed since uh, team-wise. Um, so learned a lot. And then, uh, yeah, six months here and decided, why not start something else? There's all this weird stuff happening, so give it a shot. Wow, what a story. I mean... I would just love to even just have a fraction of that story to tell. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to pause for another tune, but make sure you stay tuned to hear more of Kevin's story. As you can only tell, we've only just hit Twitch. There's more that happens after Twitch. But head on over to the Twitch channel at twitch.tv forward slash ICRT to keep on with the interview and the fun and gay. You're listening to ICRT FM 100. That was Heartbreak Anthem, Galantis, and David Guetta. And joining me in the studio today is Kevin Lin, co-founder of Twitch and also the CEO of Meta Theory. And where we just left off in your entrepreneurship journey was you've just moved to Taiwan and you felt like starting something new. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yes, I, we, I came here end of November 2020. Um, with my parents to escape COVID. Um, December 1st was my last day at Twitch that year. And uh, after six months of kind of doing not much here, um, hanging out with my parents, hanging out with friends that were in town, meeting new friends, and um, then we hit the lockdown in May 2021. And I was like, okay, I should really do something with my time or else I'm just going to do nothing. And I uh, decided after talking with um, one of my uh, good college, one of my best friends from college, David, um, and, and another uh, best pal from Twitch Days, JT, um, we started just tinkering on thoughts on what we could do. And then I met some people here in Taiwan, too, that I instantaneously, you know, sometimes you just meet people, and you're like, I'd love to do something with them. Um, uh, Nelson, Adam, that, that I had met here, and then some other friends from, from former life, uh, Bernie Gears. We also just started chit chatting about, you know, what do we want to do? And uh, Web3 was all the rage that year. NFT projects were coming out left and right. Um, and, you know, I'd always wanted to make games and animation just out of passion. I've always been curious about making those things. Uh, and we decided to start Meta Theory. Um, we originally called it Cheat Button. That was the name of the company. We always look for the sort of fast mode in life. Um, how do you make things faster and faster? Um, Eventually, we changed the name to, 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 to Meta Theory, um, and and part of the discussion was, you know, let's 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 try the remote work thing. And I had a personal desire to work with people here in Taiwan, just to really learn. Just everyone says everyone says this and that, and you know, it's not necessarily from direct experience. So I was like, you know what? If I'm gonna help, if I if I want to help the local ecosystem um, here in Taiwan, I better just learn. I better understand really what it's like to work with a Taiwanese team. 
um, I had heard so many things, right? People like to say whatever comes to mind. Um, you know, oh, Taiwan, Taiwan um, uh, talent just likes to sort of, you know, twist a knob and iterate and make things great, which is why we're so good at semi, because you're iterating on a hard problem constantly, and you have to have the patience to do that and the sort of focus and obsession. Um, but is that good for startup was always the question people here ask in the startup ecosystem. Can you train um, Taiwanese employees to really think about long-term vision, identify problems and interesting solutions, talk to customers, and learn how to get good feedback, true feedback, and be honest, intellectually honest about where things are going with product development. Um, and my experience is, yeah, certainly. Um, is the ecosystem here set up yet? No, I don't think so. Um, there's a lot of different parts. But anyway, I wanted to learn that. So that was also part of the discussion with the team of like, would you guys mind if I try building a team here? And they were like, yeah, cool, let's go for it. Let's try it out. Um, and then uh, we started on this project. Uh, we actually had a different idea. Um, our first idea um, is now back in the hopper. We're working on that behind the scenes. Um, and so that will hopefully come out maybe early next year. But the second idea, um, uh, which really Dave came up with is Dust Breakers. That's the sci-fi story that you see. Um, it's set in Africa, um, um, and there's a spaceship with a space elevator and all this crazy stuff going on. And so that's the IP that we're building, the story world. Um, but yeah, it was fun. I mean, it's been fun. I enjoy it. And then we raised some money um, just in time last May uh, before all the markets crashed. Uh, we raised from Andreessen, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, uh, legendary venture venture fund uh, based out of uh, Bay Area, uh, Pantera, which is this also a legendary um, sort of blockchain crypto focused fund, um, and a handful of others. Dreamhaven uh, was well, our first investor. There, uh, this collection of also truly amazing, you know, veteran game makers, uh, Mike Morheim, uh, Shane Beery, Paul De La Bitta, um, all these folks that had built. Blizzard, essentially. Um, they made all the games I love. StarCraft, Warcraft, um, uh, recently Overwatch, uh, Hearthstone, etc. Um, they started a new studio, uh, studio publishing group called Dreamhaven, and they, they we were fortunate enough to be their first, I think, and still only Web3 game company. Uh, they've invested in many others, but they're excellent mentors. Um, so we're trying to bring a lot of that here, too, right, to Taiwan, is you know how do we transfer some of this knowledge and mentorship um, and help help the broader ecosystem here too. Um, yeah, so that's it. So here we are trying to make games. It's really hard, actually. If you like making games, um, hit me up. Uh, if you have experience making games, hit me up here. We're Speaking looking. of which, where can people hit you up if they want to keep in touch with you and see what you're doing on this journey? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess, let's see. I guess Instagram's the easiest. Um, just Vinlin. So it's my name, Kevin Lin, minus the K and the E. That was my nickname from when I was a kid. Uh, Vinlin. Uh, on Twitter, I'm just Kevin Lin. A little confusing. But yeah, Kev, full, full name, Kevin Lin on Twitter. Vinlin on Instagram. Yeah, go and follow Kevin. Do you have a Twitch account, speaking of which? I do, Vinland. Uh, Vin same, same, same. So yeah. we can all follow that. Do you ever stream anymore? I don't. I don't. We've been kind of talking about it at work. Like, do we create Do we create a show and talk talk to our cool industry friends to, you know, educate people? So we've been thinking about it. Uh, but no, I don't. I don't really create much content. It, despite having been in the industry uh, for so long, I, I tend to shy away from it. I'm more of a shy Observer. Person. Yeah, I'm a lurker. Well, people should go and check out Meta Theory. It seems like you put a lot of heart and soul into that. And if yeah. they want to see what you've been creating, they should go and check out Meta Theory. Please do. Check us out. Twitter.com slash Dustbreakers. D-U-S-K-B-R-E-A-K-E-R-S. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, before we wrap up today, I want to ask one last question. Do you have any words of wisdom or advice you'd like to share to people? It could be general or it could be specific to building their your, their own company or story. What what advice do you like to impart with? Yeah, I mean, generalized advice. I think. Uh, let's see. Okay, something that's been top of mind recently. I was in. I went to Singapore to give a talk at this uh, accelerator uh, called Antler. They're they're super cool. Um, early, super early accelerator program for startup founders where they train you from just the desire to be a startup founder to um, putting together your own company, presentation, and even your own product and getting users. So they're sort of a pre-accelerator, so to speak. Um, someone asked there, like, why does San Francisco work? And like I mentioned earlier, it's because there's so many smart people there um, talking about stuff um, and really pushing each other to, to you know, learn faster and, and do better. Um, so I think generalized, you know, surround yourself with smart people. Um uh, obviously, you have to like them. You want to hang out with them, um, and and you know have debates, argue, challenge each other. 
you know, think really critically about stuff. Don't don't accept things for what they are, um, but surround yourself with people like that who, when you spend time with them, you're like, wait a second, did I just learn something? You know, um, I think it's really important. Um, and and obviously you have your your you have you know your friends too. You can always should always have them, um, but find people like that that can that can challenge you to think differently um, and think more openly and find those mentors, whether unofficial or official, in your life that can teach you stuff that you might not otherwise know. Um, but you know, also think about what you want to learn, what's important to you, whether it's career or personal development, um, and find those people based off of that. Think about that. Um, I think about that all the time. You know, I think what what am, what am I what am I learning? What did I learn this week? Um, what was good time spent? What was bad time spent? Um, and try to adjust. Um, not because I'm like obsessed, efficiency obsessed or anything, but it's just you know time is really important. Um, it's the one asset we have no control over. We do have control over it, but you can't you can't you can't get it back. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say that's it. Surround yourself with smart, interesting people that are nice to you and challenge you. I love that. I think one of the best advice I've ever received was if they have a website or an account, they want to be found. So right. like you were saying, go and surround yourself with those people. If you can find their website, you can find their account, go and surround yourself with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good advice. Well, speaking of time, thank you for your time and for coming here at ICRT. It's been an absolute pleasure learning your story. I feel really inspired already. Maybe I'll go start a company after this hour. Hey, give it a shot. Anybody, <laughs> if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, no, thank you so much for having me. Uh, hopefully the listeners out there got something from this. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. Absolutely. And I'll make sure to share all of Kevin's social accounts and Meta Theory account at the Twitch channel. So you can head over at twitch.tv forward slash ICRT. And if you missed anything on this interview, don't worry. We will be posting highlights from it all across our social media at ICRT. So make sure you go and follow that. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank Have you. a wonderful day. And for the rest of you, stay tuned. We're still going to be here on ICRT. So don't you turn that knob anywhere else. I could have my Gucci.